Hello everyone, my name is uh, Christopher Bremner. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, five years of high throughput strain engineering with our ECHO. Um, so we've had the ECHO for five years now. Uh, we have a couple on site now. Um, and we've learned a couple of things over the years. So I wanted to kind of do a slight review of uh, where we've come from and what we've learned over that time and where we are now. So first I thought I would start with uh, what Zymergen does. I think that helps provide a little bit of context on how we use the ECHO. Um, so we were founded in 2013 with the goal of improving the world with bio-based solutions. Uh, I've been with Zymergen since 2016 and I've seen the company <coughs> quadruple in size since then. Uh, we are located in Emeryville, California. Uh, the towns you've probably heard of are Berkeley or Oakland. Um, and we also have an office in Seattle, Washington. Um, in short, we're a science and material innovation company. Uh, we uh, improve biologic systems using fermentation. In essence, that means we optimize microbial strain phenotypes to provide drop-in replacements uh, for our clients' existing fermentation processes. Um, in addition to working with external clients, we are also developing our own novel uh, pro molecular products uh, using this similar technology. Uh, I also thought I'd provide a little context on uh, what kind of uh, things we're using the ECHO for. So uh, primarily, since we're doing synth synthetic uh, biology, we are transferring DNA. Uh, so our three main processes that we use the ECHO for are for uh, PCR preparation. So we're transferring primers and doing normalization of DNA concentrations. Uh, since we are building new uh, microbes uh, using uh, DNA assembly, we are using the ECHO to transfer DNA parts. Uh, and then finally, we are doing uh, QC of these new microbes that we assemble. Um, and so we're using next generation sequencing. So we're transferring DNA components, primers, and uh, reagents as well. So our journey with the ECHO uh, started five years ago. Much like anyone else, we were out at SLAS touring the, the exhibition floor and also touring around uh, some of our lab, uh, some other uh, labs and seeing what they use as well. And uh, what you typically see is this uh, kind of access system, uh, this system with an ECHO, a storage system, a robotic arm, a sealer, a peeler, uh, and then a centrifuge and maybe a dispenser. Um, and we were seeing this all over the place. Uh, it was the, the main type of integration we were seeing with the ECHO. So uh, when we got our first uh, ECHO device, uh, we also uh, built a very similar system. Uh, being the scrappy startup that we were, uh, we uh, only had hand tools or uh, hand saws and 80-20. So we put together this uh, system that looks similar to the, 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 the access system, but it was a little lower budget. <laughs> um, and again, it has a, an arm, an uh, echo, and uh, a peeler and a sealer, centrifuge, and, and storage. Um, and once we had it running, we were really eager to find uh, any sort of applications for it. We had identified a few and started porting over existing lab processes onto this system. Um, we were, uh, once we were able to get it running smoothly, we were able to uh, handle various different processes on the same system. Um, once we were a couple of years down the line, we realized that we perhaps got a little caught in the weeds of the excitement of having this new system that we hadn't uh, fully tuned some parts of our processes. Um, so I wanted to, to touch up upon a couple of those uh, that we learned later down the line. So uh, one, one key component of the system is obviously the, the echo device itself. Um, and when we first had the system, I kind of naively assumed that if you had any given source well on, in the uh, source plate of the echo, as long as it was covering the bottom surface of the, the wells, that it would be able to transfer that successfully. And indeed, that was mostly true. It was able to, to successfully transfer from about 99% of the wells, which is pretty good. Um, but once we were fully running, we wanted even more uh, uh, success out of the system. Um, so we uh, did what we should have done at the start and read more into the manual <laughs> and found that uh, the, for our suggested plate type and uh, reagent that we were using that the there was a, a much tighter uh, volume range that we we should have been using um, so we adjusted our SOPs and uh, taught the, the scientists to fill their source wells to that suggested volume and we were able to get a 99.8 percent success rate which was pretty good but we still wanted to 
to have even higher uh, transfer success rate. Um, so we ran our own experiments and uh, put, used a bunch of different uh, starting volumes for the, the source well on the, the source plate. And we found that if we tiled in that range to be even a little bit tighter, that we could essentially uh, eliminate all of our transfer failures on the echo, which was really nice. We're now getting about 99.99% .99 success rate on our transfers, which is really cool. Um, so I suggest uh, when you're dialing in your, pro your protocols, uh, first uh, start with your source reagents and do this sort of similar experiment by varying all the different ranges that you could use uh, for your source wells and uh, try and dial in the, the appropriate volumes that you should use. Secondly, we also had a, a similar issue with uh, bubbles. So bubbles are uh, forming in the source wells and they can interfere with the, the transfer success of the echo. Um, and so we were centrifuging our plates as, as suggested, but uh, we weren't uh, centrifuging at the, the highest uh, or at an appropriate spin rate that uh, reduced the error rate. Um, so we did a bunch of tests that of uh, our spin parameters, the, both the time it takes to spin and the g-force. Um, and once we had that dialed in, we were not seeing any uh, bubbles anymore, and we were able to get a high success rate. Secondly, uh, these uh, that fully integrated system worked great for uh, some types of workflows. So when users had uh, batches of plates, they were able to ex uh, use the system very well. They were able to load out, say, 40 <laughs> plates at the start of the day and run the system and then walk away and come back later with a complete uh, batch of plates. Uh, but for some of our users, they, were, they only had a couple of plates and just wanted to walk up to the system and uh, run their small transfers and then be, move on to the next part of their workflow. And so uh, this didn't work as well for this type of uh, workflow because users, it was a lot of activation energy for users to walk up to the system and uh, load up all their plates and then run the system. So um, users were very excited about the system and were getting good use out of it in this batch processing mode. Um, but for uh, additional users that wanted uh, much lower uh, or much a different workflow where they were just bringing a couple of plates, we needed to explore different systems. So as the company grew, uh, we were uh, expanding across Emeryville and it became inconvenient for users to, to, to walk all the way across the city to, to the main lab that had this system. And so we needed to purchase more systems, but it didn't make sense for us to build one of these fully integrated systems um, in each one of these labs. So we started looking into whether we could use the Echo as a standalone system. So then this uh, section, I'll talk about how we uh, use the echoes in standalone and some lessons we learned from that as well. So when you load up the, the echo software that comes with a new system, uh, you're able to, to control the, the echo, open the door, and run all the calibration and whatnot. In addition to this, they also have a protocol builder where you can uh, build uh, any generic protocol. So you can do a replication from a source plate to a destination plate, a set volume, and it will execute that transfer across the given range that you've selected. Uh, this works well for the, the kind of stamping protocols that some people might be doing, but for our application, we were looking to do cherry picking, so arbitrary transfers from one source well to a destination well, and also varying volumes as well. Uh, so we learned about the, uh, the application software that you can use for the Echoes. Uh, the, these are add-on softwares that you can uh, run on, on your system and they interface much like the other software as well. Uh, so for this example here, I'm going to talk about the Echo Plate reformat software that we use. Um, so this software here allows you to, to build arbitrary protocols. So in this example, I have a protocol that has multiple source wells, or source plates, I mean, and multiple destination plates. And it lets me specify uh, which transfers I'd like to do from the source plate to the destination plate. I can have different volumes for each well, um, and also uh, have uh, different uh, transfers for each plate. I'm able to run these transfers in the, the built-in software that uh, allows uh, users to, it prompts users with instructions on what to do such as inserting a source plate and, uh, and scanning a barcode and whatnot. And there's error handling as well, which is also really nice. Um, so this is really powerful. It allows users to uh, define arbitrary protocols that they want to run at a given time when they have a couple of plates and then have the, the built-in execution uh, framework to do so. 
then uh, one other interesting feature that we, we found is this optimized transfer throughput uh, button. Uh, so the, the time that the echo takes to execute these protocols is actually highly dependent on the movement of the internals of the echo itself. So there's two moving components. There's the source transducer, which moves under each source well to send an acoustic wave to that well. And then you have the destination plate that's moving around, capturing, uh, capturing all of the droplets that are jumping up from the, from the source well. And so this uh, button rearranges the hit picks that are being executed um, by the system to reduce the overall movement and thus the overall movement time. And so in order to kind of demonstrate this, uh, I actually took a video of the echo executing uh, inside the system and it makes it really obvious that the, the time savings that you can get out of this movement. So up on the top, the, the echo is uh, kind of in an op unoptimized uh, transfer list that we sent. And you can see that there's a lot of unnecessary movement around the system that actually ends up taking a lot of time. And in, this, in the bottom, we show what happens when you optimize your transfers. And uh, you can see that the movements are much shorter and it's able to execute a lot more uh, transfers in that amount of time. And to put some numbers behind this, we had a protocol that uh, had maybe a dozen plates that was taking about three hours, and when you optimize, it can reduce the time to one hour, which was a significant savings for us, um, and it allow, um, allows our users to, to use this, the systems uh, to their fullest potential. Um, so some lessons we learned in this exploration phase was that, uh, that the software is actually really powerful and allows you to, to run uh, arbitrary cherry pick protocols. Um, and then the optimization can significantly cut your, your processing time um, and uh, the, the time savings we didn't realize before we uh, were using the system um, in an optimized fashion. Um, so now I wanted to talk about a little bit where we are today as far as our use of the echoes. Um, so we use the systems in kind of three different ways. Um, so for our users in our sandbox labs, um, so users that are uh, doing a lot of uh, benchtop experiments and then might want to do uh, a few small volume transfers. Um, we have this uh, sandbox environment that allows them to do so. Um, and so this leverages the echo plate reformat software that I just demonstrated. And we just uh, created a thin wrapper around that software that um, makes a slightly uh, more friendly user experience for, for our users, so that the more customized experience. Um, so this allows them to, say, log into our limb system and pull their uh, set of transfers, and then all they have to do is click start and run the, 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 the protocol that they've created. Um, and this is great for a low volume of number of plates. Uh, they can walk up to the system, run their, their transfers, swap in a couple of plates, and then move on to the next uh, part of their workflow. Um, so this is a, just a brief example of what it kind of looks like. So the user uh, just clicks start on the system and then uh, it'll start running a transfer. Um, they then will get a prompt saying remove this plate and, uh, and uh, then the, the system will uh, clean off the source plate and it will uh, say now remove the source plate and then the user would then go on and add in another plate to the system. So it's uh, really user friendly for, for the user. Then in our uh, higher throughput, throughput sandbox environments. Uh, so you might have a, a system, uh, you see the echo off to the, to the right by itself. Um, perhaps the processes in that lab are getting a little more complex and uh, they might be running more plates through the system. So at this point, the, the, uh, we could then uh, add on a small little cart that has an arm and some storage, and then maybe another cart that has some sealers and peelers and just attach those to the echo and the users have then upgraded the system to be uh, not, no longer a standalone system. They no longer have to move plates around themselves, but they also have added capacity to run you know, 40 plates at a time, which is really nice. Um, the software we built for this is also uh, identical to the, the standalone systems. They have a consistent user experience. The only difference is now they have a little checkbox at the bottom here that says, uh, allows them to use their robotic arm uh, instead of manually moving plates around themselves. And then for our, uh, our labs where we are developing new automation systems, uh, where we are kind of prototyping uh, what uh, the future of automation might look like, we uh, started looking into uh, building a more flexible lab that would allow users to 
uh, change their whole automation system on the fly. Uh, and also in our production labs where we uh, might be changing our processes on a regular basis, say every couple of months, we needed some way to be able to uh, be flexible in our automation and allow for these reconfigurations uh, without disrupting our user's experience. And that was something that wasn't afforded by our uh, kind of previously rigid uh, integration that we had. Um, so this is the reconfigurable automation cart system that we came up with. And what this is is kind of a building block that allows us to build our uh, flexible automation system. Um, so we have a cart here that has standard connections that allow us to hook up these carts uh, in whatever fashion that we like. We have a magnetic track that can convey our pucks around the system, pucks with plates around the system, and you can have many plates on the system at a given time. We have an arm that, for each one of these carts that allows uh, plates to be removed from the system, perhaps put in a local storage or put into a device on that system. And the cart could have multiple devices if necessary. Um, and in this example here, we have an echo, but it could be any other given device as well. So here's an example of uh, the, the tracks hooked up together. So you can go around corners, you can have splits and spurs, um, and you can uh, really be very flexible in how you build the system. In addition, we, as I said, you can have a, a robotic arm in each cart. Uh, we are agnostic to which kind of arm you have, so you can have a, a little one like this or a, you know, the tip, more typical uh, arms that you see in other integrations as well. And then the, the power of this magnetic track is that it allows you to swap out carts on a, uh, on, within a couple of seconds. So it allows you to, um, whenever you have uh, downtime, you may you could just swap in a new cart that uh, you have uh, done a PM on that recently <coughs> or something like that. Um, in addition, uh, you have, uh, if you want to be able to expand your, your system, you can easily slot in one of these carts on the end and just expand your track slightly, uh, which allows you to be super flexible in uh, how big your system is and then as, uh, as your workflows grow and uh, you start using higher capacity and you want to increase your throughput, then it's really easy to add in a new one of these cards. Um, and here's a few examples of uh, some deployments that we've done in our labs as well. So the tricky part with having labs all over Emeryville is that we're very, uh, uh, we have uh, very variable uh, kind of lab spaces we have. It's uh, a little tricky to have a standardized setup between different labs or a standardized uh, space. Uh, but this system allows us to be really flexible about that. We're, we're able to go around corners. Uh, we were even able to, we at one point planned to run a track through the middle of a wall uh, that allowed us to, to span two different labs. Um, and uh, it's really nice because it allows us to be flexible uh, in, in, in any orientation. Um, so that's uh, where we are today. We have three different workflows for how we use the Echo devices. Um, so the, the last lesson we learned during this development is that the, the, the workflow that you're running can uh, heavily integrate, uh, uh, influence how you, you want to integrate these devices. Um, so thinking about how many plates you want to run, uh, when, whether you want to run in a batch system or kind of a continuous flow system, um, and whether your workflows are changing uh, or are static, and then kind of how uh, PMs look like and downtime and that sort of thing. Um, so for us, this led us to uh, three different uh, integrations which I just demonstrated. Uh, this kind of standalone system, the, the upgradable system of this full integration, full static integration, and then the modular uh, system that I showed at the end. Uh, so that's all for, for me for now, so uh, thank you very much, and I'll take questions afterwards. Uh, just uh, either flag me down outside or if we have time at the end. Great, thank you.